Okay, let's get started. So today we're just picking up where uh, we left off yesterday. We're talking about volumes by slicing again, and then we'll, uh, that will naturally lead into finding volumes of revolution. Okay, so uh, the only announcements are that uh, homework is due Monday night. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but everything, uh, discussion posts, homework, uh, everything's gonna always be done, always going to be due on Monday night. Okay, so no fuss if it's an assignment, if it's not a quiz or a test, it's due Monday night. Okay, uh, do we have any questions on anything before we get started? All right, <clears throat> so let's pick up with this example, which uh, is a pretty fun one. So uh, you wanna design a building with a floor that is an isosceles triangle, which everybody remembers as a triangle with two sides equal and the third side, who cares how long that is. And then it has a base of six units and legs of five units. Okay. The top of the building is going to be parabolas connecting the sides of those triangles. So like I have drawn here, this is a parabola connecting the sides of the, or the legs of the triangle. <clears throat> and it has a height that is equal to the width where that parabola is connecting the legs. Okay. We want to find the total volume of this building because maybe it's not a building at all. Maybe it's uh, the tank of some sort that you're filling up with water. Who knows, but it's a building. Okay, so we wanna find the volume of this. We know cross sections, no matter what, if I take a cross section of this building perpendicular to, uh, or sorry, parallel to the uh, triangular base there, then I'm going to get a parabola. So no matter how I cut it, as long as I, no matter where I cut it, as long as I cut it parallel to that six unit uh, leg of the triangle, I'm going to get a parabola, okay? So let's just pretend I'm looking straight down on the floor. Here's, here's the view straight down on the floor. The top is there somewhere. But let's connect, oh, that was an awful line there. Let's connect the tip of the triangle to the base with that line there. <clears throat> okay. And then let's say I take a cross section of a tiny little width like that. So this is the cross section I'm working with right there, okay? So I take that cross section and I'll say I take it right here. I'm measuring from the tip of the triangle. So I'll call the distance from the tip of the triangle to where I'm taking this cross section. I'm gonna call that distance T, okay? Or S, call it whatever you want. I would not call it X for, because of what I'm going to do in a minute, but I would call it anything else. I'm gonna call it T, <clears throat> okay? All right, so we take a tiny little cross section and I get a parabola over this little cross section. And I get a parabola that's supposed to have a height that is the same width as this line here. That line there, or the same height as that line is long. Okay. So this again looks like it's going to be a similar triangles problem, right? So notice the big triangle <clears throat> has a base length of six. We know that to be true, that was given. And a slant length of five, right? Well, we need, we're, we're measuring in terms of T along this line connecting the tip of the triangle to the middle of the base. So I need to know how long is the line from the tip of the triangle to that base of the triangle. Well, notice that if I write this as this length from, <clears throat> this length from here to here is three, and this length from here to here is 
three. Well, then the big triangle is really made up of two, uh, three, four, five right triangles, right? This is three. That means that this line from there to there has to be a length of four. The whole length is four. Okay, so I'm gonna write four. That's the whole length there. So, did I lose anybody there? It's almost like I picked those numbers so I would get a nice number there. Okay, so now we can use similar triangles, right? We can use the fact that if I simplify the drawing a little bit and I don't make it wonky, well, I know that the length of the big triangle here, the, the height, I know that that is four. And I know that the base is six. I'm taking a slice here where this length from the tip to this base is just T. We're defining that to be T. You should always have a well, if you're labeling something, make sure you know what the definition is of that thing. So that's T. I want to know what the width is in terms of T. So then I can just integrate a bunch of stuff in terms of T, right? So the width of this, well, we don't know it. I'm going to call it for now S. I want to write that in terms of T. But using similar triangles, I know that, well, the height of that triangle, the sorry, the height of the big triangle is four divided by the width of that big triangle is six. <clears throat> and the smaller triangle in there, it's similar. So I have to have the height of the small triangle over the width of that small triangle. That, that has to be the same as for the uh, big triangle, right? Well, four over six <clears throat> is what? That is two thirds. So that tells me that S is equal to, well, I multiply both sides by S and then I'll multiply both sides by three halves. I get S is three halves t All right everybody okay with that okay good so we know that the width of the uh, parabola there if i'm at a distance of t from the tip of the triangle the width of the parabola has to be three over two times t okay so let's draw just what the parabola looks like. So this is the parabola that I'm taking at the a distance of t from the tip of the triangle. So I'm going to write this in the x, y plane. The parabola has a width of 3 over 2t. Well, that means it has to come out 3 over 4t to the right and minus three over four t to the left. Then when I add those two things, <clears throat> I get three over two t, okay? Is everyone okay with that so far? It goes half the distance that way, half the distance the other way. Okay, and then the height has to be the same as the width of the parabola. So the height comes up. We know that that's going to be three over two times t. So this parabola looks like this. Okay. When we take it at a slice, a distance of t from the tip of the triangle. So if we know this area, and this area is going to depend on t, then I can just take an integral in terms of t and then we get the volume of this uh this shape okay so to find the area under a parabola well I'm going to need to integrate to do that as well so we're going to need to do two integrations here first I need to integrate uh under to find the area under this curve okay so to find the area under this curve, we need to say what that curve is. I'll leave it as an exercise for you guys to say that this has to be y equals 
uh, well, we have negative x minus 3 over 4t times x plus 3 over 4t, and then plus some constant. <clears throat> not, uh, sorry, not plus, times some constant, times c. The reason, I mean, I said an exercise. It, the reason it's like this is we know the zeros of this parabola, right? So we can factor it like this. So then our only job is to find C. Well, how will we find C? Writing Y in this form, I've incorporated the fact that I know the zeros are at 3 fourths T and minus 3 fourths T. So now, What's the only piece of information I haven't used? April, I think you said it, but you muted. Three halves T. Yeah, we haven't used the height of the parabola, right? So the height of the parabola, that's just where X is equal to zero. Okay, so when Y is, or sorry, when X is zero, we know Y has to be three halves T. So that's when uh, X is zero. So I'll plug in X equals zero. I'm gonna get negative C times well, uh, I'll get negative three fourths t times positive three fourths t. So that's negative nine over 16 t squared. Okay, so the negatives cancel. And I get three halves t is equal to nine over 16 t squared times c. And we want to solve for c here. We're considering t a known thing for right now. Okay, so to solve for C, I multiply both sides by 16 over 9 T squared. Okay, so I will multiply by 16 over 9 T squared times 3 over 2 T. This is equal to C. Okay, but then we get some cancellation T over T squared. I'll be left with 1 T in the bottom. 3 over 9, I'll be left with a 3 in the bottom. <clears throat> 16 over 2, I'll be left with an 8 in the top. So that tells me C is equal to 8 over 3T. Okay. So <clears throat> C is 8 over 3T. That means. Coming over here, we have y is equal to, come on, stop. y is equal to negative 8 over 3t times x minus 3 fourths t times x plus 3 fourths t. This is this curve. And so now I just want to, to find the area here. I'm going to integrate this function right so i need to find the integral and this is going to give me the area of one cross section okay this is going to give me the area of one cross section and then to find the volume i take an integral of that area in terms of t okay so i need this is the area of one cross section uh, which I'm going to call dv. It's a little slice of the volume. So that's going to be the integral. It's just the integral of this thing of negative 8 over 3t times x minus 3t over 4 times x plus 3t over 4. And this is in terms of x. It's dx. And x goes from minus 3 over 4t to plus 3 over 4t. Nope, t's in the top, sorry. So plus 3 t over 4. All right, so there's t's and x's here. But again, in terms of this integral, what can we do? So what the, this factor makes it look kind of difficult. but what can I do with that? Can't you move it to the front? Yeah, it doesn't have an X in it. 
it, so I can move it out in front. Oops, I can move it. Why did that happen? There we go. I can move it out in front. It has no X's in it. So, and as far as the integral is concerned, it's a constant. Okay, so this is the integral from minus three T over four to plus three T over four. Uh, and then I still have, I still have minus eight over three T. And then I'm going to, this is a plus B times a minus B. So this is the same thing as X squared minus nine T squared over 16 DX. <clears throat> Okay. Questions so far? And so this is negative eight over three T times. Again, the, this looks uh, complicated, but as far as the integral is concerned, nine T squared over 16 is a constant. So first, what is the integral of X squared with respect to X? x cubed divided by three x cubed divided by three very good minus now what is the integral of a constant with respect to x you just add an x right yeah it is just the constant times x again this is a constant with respect to x so i'm gonna get and i keep slapping my ipad i get nine uh t squared over 16 times x and I plug in x equals 3t over 4, and x equals minus 3t over 4. Okay. Questions so far? All right, and now we evaluate this, and it's going to have t's in it. So this is negative 8 over 3t times. <clears throat> Uh, 3t over 4 to the third, 3t over 4 to the third, and that's divided by 3, minus 9t squared over 16 times 3t over 4. And when I plug in negative 3t, I'm just going to get the same thing, but negative, right? Because x cubed and x are both odd functions. And so really, I'm just going to get two times this thing. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? When I plug in a neg the negative, same thing, the negative will pull out of the x cubed and the x. Okay, and so I'm just going to get two times, uh, times that. So I'm going to write times two, just to make our lives a little easier. All right, so let's look at this. Two times negative eight, we're gonna get negative 16 over three T times. All right, three cubed uh, is 27. <clears throat> uh, and then four cubed is 64. So there's that. And then minus, 27 T cubed. Uh, 27 T cubed. And this one's just over 64, not three times 64. Okay. Need to add a page. <clears throat> All right, so uh, questions so far. All right, the rest is simplification. So 27t cubed over three times 64 minus 27t cubed over 64. Well, the 27 over three, well, 27 divided by three, that's just nine. So I have nine t cubed over 64 minus 27t cubed over 64. So what's nine minus 27? Eighteen. Yeah, very good. And so we've got out in front, we still have negative 16 over 3t 
and then times inside the parentheses. Now we just have negative 18 uh, T cubed over 64. Okay, and then now we have a little bit of beautiful cancellation. The T out in front, a little one over T cancels with one of these T's. So I'll be left with T squared in there. 18, uh, the minus and the minus will become a plus. 18 over three. Well, scientists say that that is six. And 16 over 64. Well, that's just gonna leave me with uh, one fourth in the bottom. And so I'm left with six over four T squared. A lot of tough work to get to a nice looking answer. <clears throat> and if you wanna simplify this, you can to three over two T squared, obviously. So a lot of tough work to get to the area of that parabola, but now, what do I do with this? This was, remember, if I took a, a little slice, this was just one little slice. That's not how 3D works. Of my parabola. And I, I want to find the volume if this has a width of delta T, right? And I add all of these up. So I've been using delta T's the whole time. What people normally do is they call the width dt, and then you don't have to switch from sums to integrals. You can just say, well, the area of this parabola here, we just found that to be 3 over 2 t squared. So the volume of that thin little slice is going to be that area times that little bit of width, right? So the volume of the little slice, which I'm gonna call dv, because it's a tiny little bit of the volume, that's gonna be the area of the parabola that is one of the faces, so three over two t squared, times the little bit of width, times dt. And the reason I most people switch from delta t's to dt's is now, if, if you ever see a dt or a dv, the thing that you should naturally want to do is integrate both sides. Okay. So <clears throat> on the right, I'm integrating. The only thing I need to know is what are my bounds on this integral? So let's go back and look at our very original drawing. T is a measurement from the tip of the triangle to where I'm taking this little slice. So what does T range between? Obviously, T. I can't take t less than zero, but what's the biggest that t could be? Five. Careful, five is that slant length. So oh, four. four. Yeah, we want t to be uh, at the biggest, t is four, okay? So the integral grows from zero to four. The integral of dv is just gonna give me the volume. So v equals, now I would just want to integrate a much simpler problem, three halves t squared dt, okay? So the three halves can come out front, three halves. And then, so three halves, what's the integral of t squared with respect to t? Uh, t cubed uh, divided by three. T cubed divided by three, perfect. I want this at t equals four and t equals zero. So that three cancels with that three. And I'm left with one half times four to the third, which is 64 over two or 32 units cubed. So you will definitely, this is way harder than anything that's gonna be on an exam. Just so you guys know, I want you to see the hard problems in class and I'll give you more reasonable, pro new reasonable problems on an exam. Um, okay, but are there any questions about this problem?
<clears throat> okay, so volumes by taking slices work, they always work that same way. You get a pretty good drawing so you can see what's happening. Take a slice, figure out what happens to one slice as far as the volume goes, uh, and then you integrate that over the appropriate uh, bounds. Okay, so that's exactly what we, we said back here. Examine the solid of interest, find a, vol, uh, an, a formula for the cross-sectional area, and then you integrate that. That's exactly what we did here. We found a formula for the area of a parabola. And then once we did that, we integrated that from t equals zero to t equals four. Okay. You have a question, April? Yes, I'm sorry to ask this, but where did we go from S equals three half T to three fourths T in the graph when we were? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. So we know the whole width had to be three halves. And so I, that's why we went, yeah. No, that's a great question. It seems like it comes out of nowhere without, without that explanation. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? And again, this one, there was a lot more work involved in finding that cross-sectional area because we had to figure out the shape of the graph. Then we had to integrate uh, the, under the curve. Uh, usually the shape of the cross section is gonna be something pretty easy that you know, like a circle or a square or a triangle that you know the, the area of. And speaking of circles, that leads me into <laughs> volumes of revolution. I'm not at my office. I took my special little tool, but tomorrow I'm gonna to show you guys uh, volumes of revolution using a drill. But one type of solid that comes up all the time uh, in real life is a solid that you generate by rotating some region about an axis. And so if, uh, if people are on Facebook, I don't know if Facebook is still popular. My grandpa left Facebook. Uh, but if people are still on Facebook, they always give me the videos of people uh, doing uh, the wood turning on the lathe, lap, however you say it, where you spin a log and then you shave down until you have just the shape that you want. That is, by definition, a solid of revolution. And it's easy to, not easy, it's uh, relatively easy to find the volume of something like that, because what are all the cross sections? If you spin something around, then what, what are all the cross sections going to be? When you're done with the shaping of this thing, yeah, circular. they're gonna, yeah, they're all going to be circles. Exactly right. You spin, you take a region, you spin it around an axis, and you're going to end up with a bunch of circles, right? When you take cross sections. So one example of this is the unit sphere. Uh, you, you can generate that volume of revolution by taking the upper half hemisphere, or sorry, the upper half uh, uh, of a circle. <clears throat> and you take that and you rotate that around the x axis. Okay, it's unit. So the you take the upper half circle to be from minus one to one, right? You rotate that around the x axis. And when you do that, well, imagine this region here, when you rotate that around, sort of leaving a trail behind, and you're left with a a unit sphere. Okay. So that's one way that we that you can find the volume of a unit sphere. It's not the way the uh, Greeks found the volume of a unit sphere. They didn't know about calculus. But it, we're going to see that it's not so bad to find the volume of a sphere using uh, what we're about to talk about today. But really, what we're going to talk about today is just volumes by slicing specifically applied to this one situation, okay? <clears throat> so uh, any object that has a circular cross sections, any object that has circular cross sections can be generated in this way uh, by spinning some region about some axis. Uh, I'm always gonna, I'm never gonna have you find out what region was rotated. You're always gonna be given the region and you're going to be told, rotate that region about some line or axis and find the volume. Okay, so volumes of solids that are generated this way, we call that problem just of finding the volume of revolution instead of saying the volume of the solid of revolution because it's short. Okay, 
So let's look at a specific example, because again, this isn't really new. This is just taking volumes by slices, uh, but specifically applied to volumes of revolution. So let's find the volume of the solid that's generated by rotating the region bounded by all these curves about the X axis using the method of slice. All right, so let's draw this region that we're interested in. So y equals one over x. Well, first I'll start with the easy ones. We'll start with x equals one. There's x equals one. Wowie. Then uh, here's x equals two. I'm on a roll. X equals one, x equals two. Y equals zero done that's called the x-axis so now we just need to plot y equals one over x between x equals one and x equals two well uh y equals one over x when x is one y is one over one which is one and when x is two y is one over two which is one half and we can connect those smoothly like so so we want the region bounded by all these curves. Well, that's this region right here. I'm going to take that region and I'm going to rotate it about the X axis. Okay. And when you do that, the shape that you're going to get, and most of the time I'm not interested in drawing the whole shape that we're going to get. But here, the shape that you're going to get is something that looks like this, right? It's something that looks like that. Some uh, a, a lampshade on its side, maybe. So this is the volume that we want to, or the solid that we want to find the volume of. And to do that, well, I know again that cross sections of this thing have to be because of the way it was generated, they have to be circles. Okay. So let's look at what happens. Uh, let's start with, from this graph and let's look at what happens if I take a slice just here at X. If I take a little slice of width dx what happens when i just rotate that slice around once we figure that out then we can add up or in other words take an integral and uh get the volume of this shape okay so what does happen when we take that little slice and rotate that around the x-axis what, what do we get if i take just a little rectangle and rotate it around the x-axis what kind of shape you can tell me visualize take it's something that you probably see every day Take that little slice. Well, this edge will, when I rotate just that edge, that'll give me a circle, right? And then there's the little bit of width. And then the other edge will also give me a circle behind it. It's kind of like a coin, right? Kind of maybe a quarter or a penny or a half dollar, any of those things, right? So let me draw that a little better over here. This is the shape we're going to get. Perfect. Excellent artistry, Chase. <clears throat> so, like I said, this is going to look like a circle. <clears throat> um, the width here of this or this coin shape is dx. So then what's going to be the volume of this little coin shape? Who can tell me? Not in terms of a number or anything, but just in words. Uh, 
wouldn't it be still pi r squared? Perfect. Pi r squared, where we don't really know our job now is to find the radius. And once we know the radius, then then we're golden. Pi r squared for that's the area of that one of the circular faces. And then so for the volume of this little slice, it's pi r squared dx, right? Because I need to multiply by that little bit of uh, width. So now looking back here, what is the radius? Well, the radius is just going to be, I rotate this region about the x-axis. So that means the distance from here to there, that is the radius, right? Of the disc or the coin. Uh, so what is that width though? What is that distance? from the x-axis up to this curve. Remember, this curve is given by the y. one over x. Yeah, exactly right. That curve is one over x. So if I take a slice here at one over x, and I take a little sliver whose height it goes up to the curve, so whose height is one over x, then I end up with, after I rotate that little bit of, or that little uh, rectangle, I end up with a coin shape or a disc that has a radius of one over X. And so the volume of this thing is what? It's pi R squared DX, but then what is pi R squared? One over X squared. You, exactly right. So we're going to get pi times one over X squared DX. This is one tiny, tiny, tiny little slice of the volume. And so now that I know that in terms of X, I can say, well, let's just integrate that. It has a DX. Let's integrate it. So pi times one over X squared DX. And now I just need to know what are the bounds? And what are the bounds? Let's look back here. I took uh, X to be <clears throat> some slice in this region here. So what can X be between? One and zero. One and, uh, careful. So I agree with one. Uh, one half. Oh, oh, I see. Um, so that would be if I was taking the Y's. The Y's could be between one and one half, but what could X be? Yeah, April did it. one and two. Exactly right. Exactly right. <clears throat> so X ranges between one and two. Those are all the possible values that X could have been. Okay. And so we can just say then that we're going to get, well, pi is a constant. That comes out in front. This is pi times the integral from one to two. One over X squared. Let's write that as X to the minus two dx. And so what is the integral of x to the minus 2 with respect to x? x to the negative 1 over x, x to, yeah. Yeah, perfect. x to the negative 1 over negative 1, but 1 over negative 1 is the same thing as negative 1 times that thing. So this is what we get. Okay. So let's plug in. We get pi times, well, when I plug in negative, or sorry, when I plug in two, I get negative one half minus when I plug in one, I get negative one. Okay. And so the inside here, minus minus one is going to become just plus one. So I'm going to get one minus one half is one half. And so I'm going to get the final volume then is pi, because the pi is out in front, times one half, or pi over two. And your volumes for these volumes of revolution, if you're missing pi, something 99% of the time, that means something uh, went wrong or you forgot about the pi, because, I mean, everything's circular here, so pi should definitely be involved. Okay. So are there any questions about that? 
So again, we just took a slice. Instead of starting with the, starting with the solid and taking a slice here, I mean, we would have gotten the exact same thing if I had taken a slice by looking at the solid. But in my mind, in my simple little mind, it's easier to start with a slice of the region and rotate that and see what I get in terms of the volume and then add all of those things up. But if you would prefer to draw the shape like this, and then take a slice and look at the uh, circular cross section, that's also fine. But just so you know, I'm always going to start with the region, take a slice of the region and rotate that slice and see what I get. And that at the heart of it is every, um, not every, but a lot of uh, volume of revolution problems, okay? <clears throat> take a slice, see what happens to the slice, add them up. So this is called the DISC method. Uh, the main difference between what we're talking about today and what we talked about yesterday is that we already know beforehand with the volume of revolution, those cross sections are always gonna be circles. And so I'm always going to, I know when I make a drawing of what's happening, my cross sections, I can always just go straight to drawing a DISC in these cases. We're going to see an example later where it's slightly modified, but it's still mostly the same. Okay, So let's look at a general curve and the volume that we get when we rotate that around the x-axis. So here's some curve. This is y equals f of x. I'm going to take the region bounded by that curve and x equals a and x equals b and the x axis or y equals zero. I'm going to take this region and rotate that around the x axis and find the volume that I get. Well, nothing changes between this and that last specific example. The, your method is always going to be the exact same. You're always going to say, all right, well, I'm going to take a general X somewhere in this interval, A to B. I'm going to take a little slice or a little sliver of width DX. Let me move this arrow here. Of width DX. And rotating the region about the x axis, uh uh, let's just rotate that little sliver around the x axis and see what we get. And then we'll add up all the little slivers. Okay. So, again, when I take that little rectangular sliver and rotate that around the x axis, what shape do I get? A coin. A coin shape, yeah, or, or a disc, whatever you want to call it. If you want to call this the coin method, that's also fine. When I rotate that little rectangular sliver around the x-axis, I get a coin with some radius that, again, is our job to find that radius. But the width is dx, right? And so the volume of this little coin is pi times r squared times dx. And so now we just need to have R, we need to write that in terms of X. But what is R in terms of X? What is the radius of this coin? Well, if I come back here, that's just going to be, we're rotating about the X axis. So that's the height here, right? Well, what is that height? I'm going from the X axis up to that curve. To just f of x? Just f of x, perfect. So the little bit of volume that we get from this coin shape is going to be pi times f of x squared dx. Okay, so let me redraw, let me rename r as f of x. This is r. Okay, train coming. Okay, so we know the volume of one slice. So now what do we do? Take the integral. Yeah, we take an integral, right? When we take the, the, 
really I'm sort of skipping over what we did before of looking at the Riemann sum and then taking the limit as n goes to infinity. But when the, that process always leads to taking an integral just of this thing, right? So I'm going to take the integral from, well, we'll find out the bounds in a second, but I'm integrating pi times f of x squared dx. Okay. Now, coming back to my drawing, where can x b what are the possible values that x can take on a to b a a to b right so i just integrate from a to b and that is the volume of the solid generated by rotating that region uh about the x-axis okay. questions on this And again, this just it's a very specific application of volumes by slicing. Okay. <clears throat> so we just showed this theorem here. Uh, one thing I left out is uh, F needs to be continuous and non negative. Um, continuous just so you can be guaranteed to take the integral non negative because otherwise you're getting you're adding negative volume which is a little weird so you you want f to be uh you want f of x to lie above the x-axis when you're uh, the graph of f of x okay but if those things are true then the region uh bounded by the graph of f uh, the region that i drew before when you rotate that about the x-axis you end up with a volume of uh the integral from a to b of pi times f of x squared dx okay that is the disc or if you want to call it the coin method that's also fine also coin method questions all right so let's look at another example so we can find the volume of several um basic shapes that you know like a sphere a cone uh are volumes uh, or sorry solids of revolution so let's find the volume of a solid that's generated by rotating the region in the first quadrant that's bounded by y equals negative r over h about the x-axis and here r and h are constants so here's x here's y <clears throat> so y equals negative r over h well when x is zero, y is zero, right? <clears throat> this, I should have added something here. Uh, this was my fault. This should be a negative r over h times x uh, plus r. My apologies. <clears throat> so we're looking at y equals negative r over h x plus r there we go so now when x is zero uh y is r right and i don't know what r is but r is a constant then uh y equals negative r over h x plus r that's technically a straight line uh it's most convenient to find another point to plot it's most convenient to pick x equals h if I look at what happens when x is h, well, then y of h is negative r over h times h plus r. So y is negative r plus r, which is zero. So if I come over here, I don't know what h is, but if I come over here to h and just draw it, I'm gonna get y is zero. So I wanna know, that's a triangle, I wanna know, What's the volume that I get when I rotate this region about the x axis? And who can tell me what's the shape that I'm going to get when I do that, when I rotate that triangular region about the x axis? Wouldn't it be a cone? Yeah, this is going to be a cone, and specifically a cone laying on its side, right? 
Okay, one second. Okay, so, so <clears throat> we're going to pick up here tomorrow and find the volume of a cone that uh, has a height of H and a base radius of R, okay? And, that, and we can do that pretty easily with uh, the disk method or the coin method, again. And if you want to do this on your own, and try and figure out the solution before class. I encourage you to do that and see if you get the same thing that we get tomorrow. Okay, so uh, as of right now, I'm planning on being in person tomorrow. Uh, if that changes, I'll let you know. Okay, and as a reminder, office hours are also uh, via Zoom today. So thank you all for being here. Um, and you have most of what you need for the homework, by the way, now. So uh, tomorrow we'll cover what's called the washer method. Um, so that's that. So thank you all for being here. Uh, have a great day and I'll see everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.